Thank you for joining our Debbie's Dream Foundation webinar series. Today's webinar is on clinical trials with Dr. James Cleary. I'm Jackie Bello, Programs Manager for Debbie's Dream Foundation, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to thank our sponsors, title sponsor, Daiichi Sankyo, platinum sponsor, Bristol Myers Squibb, gold sponsors, Astellas and Merck, Silver sponsor, Lily Oncology, and bronze sponsor, Genentech. First, I will share information about stomach cancer and Debbie's Dream Foundation. Then we will hear a presentation on clinical trials with Dr. James Cleary. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A discussion. You can type your questions throughout the presentation into the chat section that appears on the webinar menu. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation as time allows. In 2019, it was estimated that more than 27,000 Americans would be diagnosed with stomach cancer each year. Many patients are asymptomatic during the early stages of stomach cancer, leading to a late diagnosis. Also, stomach cancer is on the rise for young adults. Debbie's Dream Foundation is dedicated to raising awareness, advancing funding for stomach cancer research, and providing education and support internationally to patients, families, and caregivers. Our ultimate goal is to make the cure for stomach cancer a reality. You can learn more by visiting our website at debbiesdream.org. Pictured here is Debbie Zellman, the founder of Debbie's Dream Foundation. Debbie was diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer in April of 2008. She had no risk factors and only vague symptoms. At the time, she was told that her chance of being alive in five years was only 4%. She endured harsh chemo regimens and targeted treatments and experienced many reoccurrences over nine and a half years. Unfortunately, Debbie passed away on December 23rd of 2017 at the age of 50 after a nine and a half year battle with cancer. She dedicated herself to helping others with stomach cancer by raising awareness and providing resources and education. Debbie founded DDF in April of 2009. As an organization, we will continue her important work and legacy. In a few short years, DDF has achieved many great milestones. We have 34 chapters across the US, including Canada and Germany. Our PrEP programs helps patients, their families, and caregivers match with survivor and caregiver mentors using disease-specific criteria, including stage, biomarker, and location. We host educational webinars and symposia year-round, and our website contains in-depth information about stomach cancer. We have also provided $1 million in research grants to date. In addition to research funding, we also advocate at a national level. This year, our Capitol Hill Advocacy Day was a huge success. We hosted 115 advocates and had 230 meetings on the Hill, making this our largest and most successful turnout yet. Due to the efforts of the foundation, our partners, and our dedicated advocates, we helped secure continued funding for summer cancer research. The peer review cancer research program received funding from Congress in the amount of $110 million, a $20 million increase from last year. Here you can see some of our upcoming events. To learn more, please visit our website under the heading events. DDF is headquartered in Plantation, Florida. Our office hours are Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Also on this slide are important phone numbers and email addresses you can use to contact our office and staff. We will now begin the presentation on clinical trials with Dr. James Cleary. Dr. Cleary is a medical oncologist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, specializing in treating gastrointestinal cancers. As the Associate Director of Clinical Research and the Clinical Liaison for both the Dana-Farber Early Drug Development Center and the Dana-Farber Center for Immunotherapy, Dr. Cleary has developed extensive experience leading clinical trials. 
In addition to his research, he's won awards for his clinical care at Dana-Farber and his teaching at Harvard Medical School. I'd like to thank Dr. Cleary for taking time out of his schedule today. And now, Dr. Cleary, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you. Um, I really want to thank Debbie's dream uh, for giving me a chance to talk to you today. I, I, I first um, became involved with Debbie's dream last spring when they had a uh, presentation at my institution, Dana-Farber, and it was an all-day presentation, and it really hit me how much the patients enjoyed it. Um, I had several patients who were there in person, but more patients who are like you watching it from home. And um, I, I really see the value of this work. And it really hits me. A, a lot of times my patients with gastric and esophageal cancer kind of feel left out. It's not like breast cancer, it's not as um, publicized. And I really feel like Debbie's dream is doing a really important function in raising awareness for gastric cancer, but more importantly, in supporting patients with gastric cancer. So I'm really, really excited to be here. I just want to see if I have control of the slides. Perfect. So what I'm going to be discussing today are pros and cons of clinical trial participation. Um, I really want this to be interactive, although, although I know it's difficult online. So I'm going to go through some slides, but I really want to leave some time at the end for your questions so that we could talk about any of the things I bring up during this talk or any questions that you have on clinical trials. Here are my disclosures. I always like to start off with a patient story. And this was a patient who is uh, very near and dear to my heart. He was a 65 year old man who I met at about 2015 and he had metastatic gastric cancer. Um, as we're gonna be talking about in the talk today, there's many different points where a patient could go on a clinical trial. But where he came on to clinical trials, he had already gotten treated with Fulfox and Taxol and Remesimirab. But after progressing, after his cancer progressed on both of those regimens, his oncologist told him that they really didn't have any other good treatment options. And, and one option was hospice, but another option was a clinical trial. Uh, and he decided to enroll in a clinical trial. And I'll tell you more about his story at the end. But to talk about clinical trials, the first thing I really want to say is We've never really seen a time like this in oncology. It's an incredibly exciting time. Um, with the Human Genome Project and advances being made in basic science laboratories and things like immunobiology, we're really seeing that science has gotten more sophisticated. So there's been really a huge need to bring those advances being made into the laboratories into patients. And, and the way we do this is with clinical trials. So clinical trials are when you're doing research on people. And obviously, enormous responsibility um, comes into play when you're doing uh, experiments on people. And there's, so we're going to talk about a lot of regulatory authorities and ethics boards that really do a very, very good job in making sure that this research is as safe as it can be and also ethical. And we'll talk more about that later. But in terms of clinical trials, what clinical trials are is they're um, an experimental therapy that a patient is trying. And the goal of the entire program is to try to demonstrate the effectiveness of this drug, but also the safety of this drug. Now, while the goal of the entire research program, going through multiple phases of clinical trials, I'll talk about the word phase in a second, um, is proving the effectiveness and safety of the drug. The goal of a particular trial depends on the phase of that study. And I'm going to talk about phases in a second, but before talking about that, I think it's important to think about what are the reasons to consider clinical trials. Now, one reason is that it might add to the efficacy of the current treatment uh, that you are offered. So for example, if your oncologist is offering you a treatment called Fulfox, perhaps taking a, an experimental drug with the Fulfox will increase the efficacy of the Fulfox. The other one, as the patient I just described, is it increases treatment options. As sometimes patients start having limited treatment options and having the access to clinical trials increases treatment options. The one thing I didn't list here is obviously there's also an altruistic component to this. Um, and the way we make advances in, in, in cancer care is through clinical trials. But really what I encourage my patients is not really to think about that. Even though it's an incredibly altruistic thing, it's hard enough having cancer. And I really think you only should do a clinical trial if you feel like it's the right fit for you. 
Uh, and I think that's very important. And another point I like to make is the standard treatments are pretty good. And, and so I don't think there's anything wrong in just sticking with the standard treatments either. Sorry. Okay. So I mentioned before that we were going to talk about the different phases of trials. And, and I, I like this slide because it sort of shows how a drug matures uh, through the clinical trials process. So in the first step, you have preclinical research. And what we mean by that is that's not in people. That's experiments in cell lines and in animals, trying to see if a particular experimental therapy has promise. And I can tell you from a pharmaceutical company's um, perspective, one of the most important decisions and difficult decisions is to take a drug from preclinical research into clinical research. The reason they spend so much time thinking about this is clinical trials, just from a business perspective, are very expensive. So they can identify several promising compounds, but they really spend a lot of time vetting these chemicals to see which one they think has the most promise. And included in these preclinical research is what disease should we put it in? Should we put it in breast cancer? Should we put it in gastric cancer? Should we have put it only in a certain type of gastric cancer that have a certain biomarker? And these are all decisions they're thinking about preclinically. But once the drug company has made the important and difficult decision about going from preclinical testing to a phase one trial, then the drug is in human beings. And so the thing I want you to hear about phase one trials is these are the most experimental trials. And what I mean by that is, since we're trying it for the first time in human beings, unfortunately, phase one trials have the lowest chance of working. Um, when we think about a phase one trial, we think that the primary focus of this trial is trying to figure out the safety of the drug and the highest safe dose of the drug. So for example, if it's one drug, we'll start off a phase one trial giving three patients. And most of the time in phase one trials, I should mention, it's not just for gastric cancer, it's for all solid tumors. So there might be patients with breast cancer on the trial, patients with uh, lung cancer, and patients with gastric cancer. So we'll put three patients on in a low dose, say 20 milligrams, and we'll see how they do in terms of safety over a four week period. If all three patients tolerate the drug safely at 20 milligrams, the next three will go on at 30 milligrams. And then we'll see how the next three patients do at 30 milligrams in terms of safety. And again, if they do well, we'll go up to 40. Say we, the patients at 40 do well and we get up to 50, but two people have a serious side effect at 50, that tells us that the dose of 50 is too high and that they would bring the dose back to 40 milligrams. If everyone tolerates 40 milligrams, that's the right dose. And that's the dose they'll use in phase two studies. But again, coming back to phase one trials, these are the most experimental trials. They're also very time consuming because there's a lot of additional testing that goes on in phase one. Um, but that said, while there are drawbacks in terms of being long shots and being very time consuming, they do give patients, and that was the patient I, I started off the talk by, an option to continue therapy when oftentimes there's really no other th therapies. Phase two trials, have a little bit more of a track record than phase one. And what I think about phase two trials is, is these are trials maybe between 50 and 100 patients where you're looking to see, you know, how well does this drug work? How, is this, how well does this drug, and it would only be gastric cancer. How well does this drug work in gastric and esophageal cancer? Do patients seem to live longer? Do their cancer seem to get smaller? And then in many ways, I think of phase three as the final stop. Phase three are very large, statistically powerful trials where we're asking, does this drug work better than the existing standard of care? And if after phase one, phase two, and phase three, we see that the drug is safe and effective, making patients with gastroesophageal cancer live longer, then the FDA would approve it. Uh, and really, this is really what we're all trying to get towards is FDA approval. Occasionally, you'll see these phase four studies. These are post-marketing studies, meaning the drug's already FDA approved. They're rare, and I really wouldn't think about it. I really would just think about phase one, trying for the first time in human beings, trying to figure out the safety, hoping you'll see some efficacy. Phase two, medium-sized trials, looking at effectiveness. And phase three, the definitive study, we call it the regulatory study, because if it works, you'll get regulatory approval and FDA approval. So there have been, and, and again, this is an exciting time. In gastroesophageal cancer, in the last five years, there's been at least three FDA approvals. 
There's been an FDA approval in immunotherapy called pembrolizumab, also called Keytruda. Um, Ramacimarab has been FDA approved. It can be given as single agent or in combination with Taxol. And TAS-102, which is also called Lonserf, also was recently approved. And all of these drugs had to go through that phase one, phase two, phase three process, but now have been proven to be effective in the majority of patients with gastroesophageal cancer. An important thing we touched on before is that there's really a big responsibility of doing clinical trials on human beings when you're really experimenting on people. And the federal government has put a lot of safeguards in place to make sure that these trials are as safe as possible and also as ethical as possible. And it all started from this Belmont report, but really the key thing here is this abbreviation IRB. It stands for Institutional Review Board but I think of it as the ethics board. So the ethics board has clinicians on it, but it also has patient advocates on it, just making sure that these trials are as ethical as possible. And to talk about how this works, there's a pathway for a clinical trial to become approved. In many institutions, the first stop is what's called the scientific review committee. And that's really a, um, a committee made up of clinicians and scientists, just making sure, are they asking a question that's worth asking? because we really only wanna be doing clinical trials that are asking important questions that are gonna help the care of our patients. But the most important stop is here in the Institutional Review Board, the Ethics Board, where they really look at the protocol, making sure and making it as safe as possible for patients, and if that's ethical for patients. And they're gonna look at something called a consent form. And what a consent form is, is it's a document, unfortunately it's quite long usually, it's usually about 30 to 40 pages, explaining the trial at a fourth grade level. So they really wanna make the explanations of the trial very accessible to the vast majority of patients. Once the trial gets IRB approval, the trial starts, but still it gets reviewed by the IRB every year just to make sure there hasn't been any recent advances that would say the trial is no longer ethical. So the trial is gonna get looked at at least once a year to make sure it's still asking a valid and ethically responsible question. I like to talk about this drug, it's called crizotinib, because it, it really shows um, a success story in drug development, but it also shows how quickly uh, a drug can uh, start helping patients. And um, it started right when I was starting oncology in 2006, and there was a phase one trial of a drug called crizotinib that hit two proteins, one was called ALK and one was called MET, but people were most excited about the MET part, that this was going to be a MET drug and that um, a lot of cancers are driven by this protein called MET. And if we had a good drug against MET that we could start shrinking cancers. Um, interestingly, the trial when it started in phase one was a complete flop. And you know people were very disappointed and discouraged. But then about after that phase one had been open for about a year, uh, uh, unexpected discovery happened in Japan that lung cancer patients have this translocation called EML4 ALK. And all of a sudden people started saying, you know what, we shouldn't call crizotinib a MET inhibitor, we should call it an ALK inhibitor. And then this trial, which hadn't helped one patient, there say it was like 30 patients who had all progressed on crizotinib. Once they changed their strategy and said, you know what, we're only gonna treat patients with this ALK abnormality. This drug went from a complete flop to an enormous winner. So what they did is they saw this discovery in 2007, very rapidly said, this is, these are gonna be the only patients we treat because the idea is if you don't have ALK, crizotinib is not gonna work because while it's a great drug for patients with ALK, if you don't have ALK, it really doesn't work that well. And so they put only patients with ALK and all of a sudden they went from everyone, this drug not helping to basically the vast majority of patients it helped. And rapidly, this drug went from phase one, and they started seeing these responses, by the way, in phase one. And that's another point I want to drive home is even though phase ones are highly experimental, this was one case where basically all these patients who went on phase one who had this abnormality benefited. And then very rapidly went to phase one, went straight to phase three, and by 2011, it was approved. And this is just showing an example of one patient with an ALK translocated cancer that went on this ALK inhibitor and really showing how this tumor really just disappeared. This is a type of graph we call a waterfall plot. And the idea is, again, this is the phase one trial of patients who had an ALK 
translocation. So phase one, and it still really had a nice response rate. So what this is, is when you're below zero, this means the cancer shrunk by say, here it's 30%. This means this unfortunate patient, their cancer got bigger by 50%. And really what this waterfall plot shows us is this small number of patients, unfortunately, for whatever reason, the crizotinib didn't help. But these patients here, all of these patients, their tumors got smaller. And as a matter of fact, in these last four patients here, their, their tumors shrunk 100%. So this is really showing that ex occasionally when we find a, a really good drug with a really good target, we really can help patients. And this is an example of a patient I treated. What we did is we started seeing that ALK was expressed in other cancers, and even very, very rarely, less than 1% in gastric cancer. Uh, and um, we looked for those other cancers. This is a patient with lymphoma who had this huge tumor here, and by eight weeks, the tumor had shrunk. Um, and interestingly, this patient was treated back in 2012 on the phase one trial, and he's still alive now in 2020, uh, and it's doing very, very well. So occasionally, we do have these home runs. A big thing you're going to hear about in clinical trials is immunotherapy, and, and there's a reason for this. This is something we're so excited about. Uh, and, and I like to think about the origins of immunotherapy being from vaccines. And I know vaccines are in the news a lot today because of COVID-19, but it really just shows the power of these vaccines. But before there was COVID-19, there was a disease called smallpox that was horrible and, and really would kill hundreds of thousands of people in the uh, 1600s. And interestingly, some very clever physicians started noticing that milkmaids never got cowpox, never got smallpox. And what they recognized was these milkmaids would get a very similar disease to smallpox called cowpox, where they get lesions on their face, but they wouldn't be big. And it turns out they didn't know it at the time, it was the 1600s, but it turns out that cowpox was a very close cousin to smallpox. So that the immune system, once it figured out how to treat cowpox, which was a very benign illness, but once the immune system figured out how to treat cowpox, you also were vaccinated from smallpox. And that's where they started getting the idea of vaccines. And eventually this matured um, and it went from, officially they would even take scrapings of people with cowpox to try to protect them from smallpox. But eventually they got more and more sophisticated and we started getting vaccines. And probably one of the biggest triumphs in all of medical history occurred in 1977 when we eradicated smallpox, a disease that killed probably over, easily over a million people um, just by using vaccines. So once we saw the power of the immune system to treat infectious diseases, uh, oncologists have been trying to use the immune system to treat off cancers. And for a long time, it, it was a dream. And it just really, we, we, it just didn't seem like it ever was achievable until about 2016, 2017, when these immune th therapies started working. And I'll tell you how it works. Ordinarily, when a cancer develops, the immune system should kill it off since it's foreign. As a matter of fact, we know that most cancers in people actually never even develop because the immune system just kills it off. So in order for a cancer cell to be successful, it has to learn how to camouflage itself from the immune system. One way to camouflage a cancer from the immune system is to use this molecule called PDL1. Because what PDL1 does is it binds to these immune cells and puts a break on them and tells them not to attack. So unlike here, where the immune cells are killing off the cancer cells, here the PDL1 really functions as a break to tell the immune cells not to attack, and that lets the cancer grow. So the big advance were these drugs that block this PDL1 protein. And these are called PD1 inhibitors like pembrolizumab like nivolumab, like this drug Keytruda. And really what the drug does is it's these red circles in this diagram, and it blocks this interaction. It blocks the ability of PDL1 to turn off the cancer cells. So the cancer cell, instead of being turned off by the, the, but the, instead of the immune cells being turned off by the cancer, the drug blocks this interaction and the immune cells are able to start killing off the cancer cells again. And here's another way to think about it. You're gonna hear the phrase checkpoint inhibitors. And this is what we think about, that basically in a military sense, you got a checkpoint that's protecting the cancer, this red blob. But when you give the um, um, immunotherapy, drugs like Keytruda, that this checkpoint is lifted and the immune cells can go and kill off the cancer. And that's why we call them checkpoint inhibitors. 
And there have been successful immunotherapies in gastroesophageal cancer. So the one that is FDA approved now is pembrolizumab. And we see that pembrolizumab can cause tumor shrinkage. Again, this is this waterfall plot where here shows cancers getting smaller. Unfortunately, these patients got their cancers bigger despite the Keytruda. But these fortunate patients over here had their cancer get smaller in response to Keytruda. We now know uh, that Keytruda pembrolizumab works in about 15% of patients with a pdl one positive gastroesophageal cancer. So if you fall within that 15%, and we wish we could predict ahead of time, but we're just not sophisticated enough yet. But if you're one of those 15% where the, you have a pd one positive cancer and a Keytruda can work, super. Sometimes the responses can be durable over a year. However, what, what the heartbreaking thing of this drug is it doesn't help about 85% um, of patients. So it still shows that we really need more research to try to get these immunotherapies working more frequently. So I, I wanted to now talk about patient perspectives of clinical trials and, and think about questions that you should be talking about with your oncology team. And I think the first question is, is there a clinical trial available? Uh, and, and just to have that conversation, you know, is there a clinical trial available here? If not, is there a, a, a medical center around me that I could go to to get on a clinical trial? I think it's a good conversation to have when you're talking to your oncologist. Once you find out a clinical trial is available, I would talk to your oncologist about the pros and cons. Does your oncologist think it's a worthwhile trial? And, and I think they'll be honest with you. I think, you know, there's some trials we're less excited about than others. And so really just really trying to get their honest opinion about what they think is a, a worthwhile trial and what is not, I think that's a good conversation to have. Also asking them about the consent forms. Um, just taking a look at the consent form, and that will tell you what the side effects are and, and how much time you're going to have to spend on the trial. So I think asking to look at a consent form that can explain the trial to, to you and also just talking to your oncologist about the side effects, I think those are two very, very important things to do. One thing I, I think there's understandable anxiety about is whether there's a placebo. And, and I totally understand why patients are apprehensive about this. But the one thing I want to say is we have to tell you ahead of time if there's a placebo being used in the trial. So you and, and I'm never, I'm never offended when a patient comes up to me and asks about a placebo because the honest answer is I'd be asking that. So it's a good question to ask and just say, look, is there a placebo? Is there a chance I'm going to get a placebo on this trial? Many trials don't use a placebo. Some do, and we will tell you ahead of time. Um, the other thing, especially for phase one trials, but even for phase two or three, is are these trials going to be really time intensive? Like sometimes it's not just a question of being on a trial and perhaps getting side effects. It's also that maybe... Um, you're going to have to have a couple extra visits, and sometimes the visits can be really long. So asking about logistical challenges, like how, ex how much extra time you're going to have to spend at the cancer center, are important. Another really good question is, does your insurance company cover the standard of care cost of the trial? I should say I practice in Massachusetts, and we're spoiled because in Massachusetts, there's a state law that insurance has to pay for the standard of care cost of a trial. Let me explain that. So when you go on a clinical trial, so when you're getting standard of care, say you're getting standard of care full fox. When your oncologist is treating you with standard of care full fox, your insurance is going to pay for the full fox. Your insurance is going to pay for the CT scans and the blood tests. So those are considered standard of care costs. So the idea is if you go on a clinical trial, all of those typical blood test, the standard of care chemotherapies like full fox, the standard of care scans, all those things are going to be covered by the insurance company. Whereas the research costs, things like the experimental drug, um, getting a research biopsy or getting uh, research blood tests, looking at the level of the study drug in your blood, that gets paid for by the pharmaceutical company. So again, in Massachusetts, the law is that if you go on a clinical trial, the insurance company has to cover those standard of care costs, those things that you would have been get you, the insurance company would have been paying for, like ordinary blood tests, ordinary CT scans, if you hadn't been on a trial and just getting regular therapy. Unfortunately, other states don't have this law, and so it's really important if you're in another state uh, or if your insurance is in another state. That's the key thing. I have patients who live in Massachusetts, but their insurance is from another state. Just to sort of ask, is your insurance company going to cover the standard of care cost? That's an important thing. 
the next thing, once you decide to do the clinical trial is eligibility screening. So when you enroll on a clinical trial, the first thing they have to do is just make sure you're healthy enough to do this study. And there's a lot of different eligibility criteria you have to go through to get on a study. For example, you have to show that your liver is healthy enough, your heart's healthy enough, your kidneys are healthy enough, that this trial isn't going to put you at undue risk. And so oftentimes, they'll be doing screening tests, maybe even things like eye exams, for about one or two days. And those tests have to meet a certain standard in order for you to go on a trial. And sadly, if they don't meet a certain standard, you can't do this study, and we hate that, uh, and, and just because it's heartbreaking for patients. Um, but what I mean by this is, um, if the trial says that your platelet count has to be above 100, and they usually do, and your platelet count just keeps coming back at 99, we have to tell the patient, um, and, and we, we hate doing this, but unfortunately, there's no wiggle room around it, that they can't do the trial unless their platelet count gets above 100. But assuming um, that the patient's eligible and passes screening, the patient then begins a trial. And what I tell people is typically in terms of CT scans, the CT scans happen as frequently as you would if you were just doing regular standard therapy like Fulpox. You usually get CT scans every eight weeks. And if the scan shows your cancer is getting smaller or staying the same size, you just keep going with the trial indefinitely as long as you're tolerating it. Whereas if the scan shows that the cancer is getting bigger, that's a red flag saying we should take you off the trial and go ahead and do something else. I found this on the NCI webpage and I found it to be incredibly helpful. And this was um, a research project where they looked at patient reported reasons for declining clinical trials. And I think all these reasons are valid. And I think they're worth talking about. One fear, fear of side effects. And I think this is a real fear. And I think it's important to talk with your doctor about what the potential side effects of the trial are before you enroll. Um, in terms of phase one studies, there's data looking at did more patients die on phase one studies um, than patients who just got standard th of care therapy? And reassuringly, the answer was no, that really the risk on these, they looked at 100 phase one studies, the risk on these phase one trials were comparable to the risks of um, standard of care therapy. But again, that's looking at 100 trials and every trial is different. So I do think it's worthwhile looking at the side effects of each trial and having a careful conversation with your oncologist and also looking at the consent form where the uh, potential side effects are listed. Another big one, and we've already talked about this, is the fear of a placebo right here. That uh, patients are, are worried about getting a placebo. This is incredibly understandable, and, and we totally get this. The one thing I could tell you is that um, you have to be told ahead of time that you're going to be you could that you could receive a placebo. Um, the other thing is they only the ethics board will only allow us to use a placebo where the comparator therapy really is nothing. So for example, um, in colon cancer, we recently did a trial that approved Lonserf. And they tested Lonserf in a population where there really was no therapy. That basically, in that situation, kind of like the patient I talked about in the beginning, you would sort of say, look, we have no more treatments for you. So in that case, where your oncologist would be telling you there's no more treatments for you, yeah, they often do use placebo as a control. Another place where they use placebo as a control is where they'll you'll get the chemotherapy you ordinarily would be getting, say Fulfox, but patients will be either get a 50% of getting 50% chance of getting Fulfox and placebo, or 50% chance of getting Fulfox and an experimental drug. Another reason, another very valid reason we hear patients aren't interested in clinical trials is logistical concerns. That is just so busy getting back to these trials. And also another thing that we feel badly about is a lot of patients don't live in major metropolitan areas like Boston, New York, or Houston, and they're not close to a center that does these phase one studies. So that a patient, I've had patients fly to Boston from Cleveland to do the trial, and we always feel badly about that. So I think discussing logistical concerns makes sense, whether it's that you have to travel from one city to another, or it's that you already live in Boston, you're getting a trial in Boston, but still, 
they're going to make you come for um, treatment very frequently. And I think those are very real uh, concerns. We talked about cost and just making sure that your insurance is going to pay for the standard of care costs. Um, and yeah, those are those are the main themes they saw when patients decided not to do a trial. I think they're all very valid. So I wanted to just run through a couple of different clinical trial designs, just so you can see them. This is actually a colon cancer trial that we did here at the Farber, but I liked it because it really gets a, a point, a, 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 um, a, a type of design. And really what the type of design is, in colon cancer, the standard of care is patients get Fulfox and Bevacizumab. So what you can see is patients who went into this trial were randomized, 50% of patients went on arm A and 50% of patients went on arm B but everybody got the standard of care. And this is the main point I'm trying to get across with this slide. Everybody got full Fox Bevacizumab, whether you're on arm A or B. The only difference was that in this experimental arm, these patients got high dose vitamin D. And here, these patients just got uh, the regular multivitamin dose of, of vitamin D. So really what they were trying to test was, yes, everybody got full Fox Bevacizumab. And as an oncologist, that's what we care about because that's the stuff we know works. But then they wanted to see, does adding this vitamin D help you? Another type of clinical trials, and this gets to the placebo issue, is this TAS-102. And this is TAS-102 in gastric cancer. This is what the trial that led to TAS-102 Lancer's FDA approval. And so what they did is they took patients who had gone through uh, drugs like uh, Fulfox, and ramesimurab and taxol, and our oncologists often would tell them, look, we don't have any other therapies for you. And um, patients who were interested went through eligibility testing and they were randomized. And, and in the randomization, the computer takes into account certain factors, but really the key factor is the patients were randomized. Some patients got the LONSERP, TAS-102, some patients got placebo. Here, and this is a key point when doing a placebo-controlled trial, you can see that it actually wasn't a 50% chance of getting placebo. It was more like uh, two out of three. So 66% of patients got the Lancer, whereas only 33% of patients got placebo. Another type of clinical trial is where you're guaranteed to get the experimental agent. So at my institution right now, we have a phase two trial combining a PARP inhibitor and ramesimurab, and that's all you get. So when you sign up, you know there's no placebo. You're just going to get the PARP inhibitor and ramesimurab. And phase one studies are this way too. There's never a placebo in phase one. One point I want to drive home, I spoke about the importance of talking to your oncologist about clinical trials. I really want to say that the clinical trial portfolio at any institution anywhere in the world is it's very dynamic. It, it's always changing. So trials that we had at the Farber six months ago, many of them have closed and we've opened new ones. So if you ask your oncologist, um, in January, about clinical trials says, you know what, I just don't have any good options for you right now. I'd ask them again in um, March and just say, look, as it changed, and, and you're going to be surprised that the answer does change. So just keep having this conversation. Don't just think if you have the conversation once that that's going to be the answer forever because trials are always opening and closing. So I wanted to close just by talking about a few clinical trial vignettes. Um, and I used, what I did is I, I took how we're treating patients at Dana-Farber right now and uh, talked about here, both the standard of care options and the clinical trials we have at Dana-Farber. Again, one theme is that multiple institutions around the country have different trials. And since they're trials, it's hard for us to know which one's better than the other, but this is just the way we're, the trials that we happen to have at Dana-Farber right now. So for patients with newly diagnosed metastatic gastric or esophageal cancer. What we, we treat them at the Farbers, we typically will give them a regimen called Fulfox, which is two drugs, 5-Q and oxaliplatin. So most patients, that's what they get. That's how you know, I just want standard therapy. And I, I do want to drive home, standard therapy is good. I, I, I'm very happy if a patient tells me, I just want to do Fulfox. I'm like, great, this is good therapy. Let's go with it. But for patients who are looking for clinical trials, at the Farber, what we're doing is we have two clinical trials that are biomarker driven. And what this means is these trials only have a chance of working if your, pro, if your cancer expresses a certain protein. So we're screening patients to see if they have one protein called Claudin 18 and another protein that a lot of you have heard of called HER2. If the patients 
are positive for Claudin 18, we can put them on a clinical trial of Folfox and a Claudin inhibitor. And then the control arm is Folfox and placebo. So this is a placebo controlled trial. But again, I want you to notice that patients in both arms are getting the standard of care therapy Folfox. If patients are HER2 positive, the clinical trial option we have for these patients is they're going to get KPOX, which is basically giving oral Zolota instead of 5 of you, which works just as well as Folfox. So they're getting KPOX, a HER2 drug called trastuzumab or Herceptin, and pembrolizumab Keytruda. So basically, it's, we call it triple therapy, KPOX, Herceptin, and Keytruda, versus KPOX and trastuzumab, because we consider KPOX, trastuzumab, KPOX, Herceptin, the standard of care in HER2 positive gastroesophageal cancer. So all patients are getting the standard KPOX and trastuzumab, but some patients are getting placebo and some patients are getting pembrolizumab because the trial, this, the, the question this trial is trying to answer is in comparison to the standard of care, KPOX or septin, does adding pembrolizumab make a difference? And that's why this arm gets placebo. For this same patient, um, when the first line Folfox, what I mean by first line is that's the first treatment they got when they had metastatic gastroesophageal cancer and eventually it stopped working. So once the first line Folfox stopped working, the way we're treating these patients standard of care is giving them Taxol and Ramacimrav. Again, I think this is very good therapy. But for patients who are looking for a clinical trial, our clinical trial option right now is a lapper of a PARP inhibitor and Ramacimrav. And then for patients with refractory cancer, so those are patients who've gotten all the FDA-approved therapies. They've gotten Fulfox, their cancer progressed on Taxol Ramacimarab, their cancer progressed on Pembrolizumab and TAS-102 or Lancer. Those are the patients we're putting on phase one trials. And I just wanted to wrap up by a patient who was in this situation. This was the patient we started off the whole talk with, a 65-year-old man with metastatic gastric cancer, he had progressed through Fulfox, cancer had progressed through Fulfox and Paxil Remisimrab. He decided not to do hospice and wanted to do a clinical trial. He recognized that there was no more standard care options at the time. This was about 2015. And so he enrolled on a phase one trial with me of a drug called nivolumab, which is a PD-1 immunotherapy, just like Keytruda and Ipilimumab. And this was when we first were starting to do immunotherapy. So we just didn't know what to expect. Now we know that it works in 15% of patients with pdl one positive gastric cancer. We didn't know that then. And, and we were just amazed to see his response to the immunotherapy. And he responded to, to for over a year. And it really was a wonderful uh, story. Um, really, really nice man. I, I remember it just because of how sick he was when we first started. And I, I, I just wasn't sure how much time he had left when we first started. And to see him get so much better that he was able to travel and spend a lot of time with his relatives, it really was wonderful for me to watch. And I should also say that we're incredibly grateful to all the patients who do these trials because this is how we learned about this drug. And we're still continuing to do work on immunotherapy just based on the progress that these patients allowed us to make. So I wanted to stop there and take questions. And again, I just wanted to thank Debbie Stream for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Cleary. We did have some questions come through during your presentation. Okay, the first one, who oversees my care while I'm on a trial? Will my oncologist be involved too? Oh, uh, this is a great question. So um, it depends on the, on the institution. Um, so you always will have an oncologist overseeing your care. So at large academic centers, most of the time, it's your oncologist who's overseeing your care. So most of the time, it's the same oncologist who's been treating you who has you on the clinical trial. If you're being referred to another institution, you're going to meet a different oncologist at that institution. And I'll just give an example from what we do here. We work very closely with oncologists from New, New Hampshire and Maine and those oncologists will refer patients down to see us and i'll take care of their patient while they're on the trial so i'll be their main contact while they're coming here for the trial but that oncologist up in new hampshire i still feel like is an incredibly important person and we try to collaborate and so that if the patient needed to go into the hospital locally 
I still can um, talk to that oncologist up in New Hampshire and we can work as a team. So I, I usually think of this as a team approach when we're using multiple institutions. Great. Next question. Um, will the results of the trial I'm participating in be provided to me? Ah, great question. This is something that's really um, come into focus in recent years. Uh, embarrassingly, I would tell you before 2010, really never. And then all of a sudden, as an oncology community, I think because of patient advocate groups like Debbie's Dream, we started realizing that was a very bad approach and really wasn't respectful to the people who were um, participating in the trial. So we try to make the results of the trial known to patients. Um, there is a time delay um, between when you start a trial, when the results come out. Um, but many trials are making an effort to, to notify uh, patients when the trial works. But I, I really want to answer this question carefully, saying that we realize it's important, but oftentimes we don't know the results for a couple of years after you participate. So that's okay. the one issue. Okay, next question. I've heard that if your insurance does not cover the trial, you will be denied. Is that true? Sorry, can you, can you repeat that question? I've heard that if my insurance does not cover the trial, I will be denied. Is that true? So, you know, so if your insurance, we talked about this before, and it's such an important question. If your insurance says that they won't cover the standard of care cost of the trial, I always think I've had a couple of cases where patients from other states, we try to put them on a trial and also we get a denial and the insurance company is saying, look, we won't even cover the basic blood tests like a comp and a CBC and the CT scans. We're just not covering it because it's an experimental therapy. We, what we try to do in those circumstances is we try to get on the phone with the insurance company and explain to them the situation. And we've had a lot of those reversed, but now just taking the draconian view that say the insurance company just continues to say no. Yeah, so if the insurance company continues to say no, and, and, and I'm happy to say, I wanna say how rare this is. I haven't seen this in the last several years. It could be where I practice though. Um, if the insurance company continues to say no, then it's not that the patient will be denied the trial. It's just oftentimes just not financially feasible. So you can put the patient on the trial. It's no problem. It's just that the patient would be responsible for the standard of care costs. And those can be prohibitively expensive, tens of thousands of dollars. Again, I really want to emphasize, I haven't seen that in years. And we're, we really try very, very hard to work with the insurance company to make sure that doesn't happen. Great. Okay, next question. Will the trial cover expenses if I have to move to participate? Yeah, great, great question, great, because th it, that's incredibly expensive. Um, and unfortunately, the answer is, by and large, no. Sometimes they might pay a little bit for a, a hotel here or there, but most of the time, they do not pay for it. And that's incredibly unfortunate. The one exception to that is the National Cancer Institute. The National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, is a taxpayer-funded clinical trials unit. And uh, their number, by the way, it's very easy to remember. It's 1-800, the number four cancer. 1-800-4 cancer. They'll screen you over the phone, by the way. And they have a lot of good studies down there. Um, they'll pay for everything. They'll pay for your lodging. They'll pay for your plane going back and forth. It's very nice. Most institutions like mine, we just don't have the resources for this. Um, and occasionally a pharmaceutical company might, might reimburse you for gas or a hotel. But it, it's, it's rare. And it, it's something we really need to think about as a cancer community to make sure we can make clinical trials more available to people in distant areas. So we recognize that's a problem and we're working on it. Great. Next question. Is Keytruda a great immunotherapy for stomach cancer? What percentage is working? Yeah, so I wanted to sort of say that carefully. So Keytruda works 15% of the time for patients who have a biomarker, a protein called PDL1. And, and so what I would ask is I'd ask your oncologist, does my cancer express PDL1? If your cancer expresses PDL1, then you're eligible to get Keytruda. And again, Keytruda works about 15% of the time if your cancer is PDL1 positive. I should also mention though that 15%, we wish it was much higher. Occasionally, and this is about 5% of the time, we'll see a patient with gastric or esophageal cancer who has what's called mismatch repair deficiency or an MSI high tumor. That's another very easy biomarker to do. And I'd really encourage all of you to ask your oncologist to see if your cancer is MSI high. 
if your cancer's MSI high, we really need to get you on um, Ktrude or Pembrolizumab because those are the patients who have really wonderful responses. Unfortunately, I, I really want to say it carefully so I, 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 I don't misrepresent it. It, it. We only see it in about 5% of gastric cancers, but if you're in that 5%, uh, that's that's one of those ones that oncologists get so excited about. So it's so worth testing because it's an easy test. How do you get tested for MSI? Yes, it, it's um, there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, one of the ways is your oncologist can order a IHC, which stands for immunohistochemical test, where they look for these proteins to see if your cancer is an MSI high tumor. The other is doing something that we an approach we really like called molecular profiling or looking at what genes are mutated in your cancer. And, and these tests that are often are also called next generation sequencing, what they do is they'll take a piece of your cancer that's removed from your body, extract the DNA, and look to see what mutations were caused by the cancer. And occasionally we'll see a drug that's, that maybe you're in that less than 1% to have an ALK rearrangement. But occasionally we also see from that sequencing test that your cancer is an MSI high tumor. And ways to do this is you can ask your oncologist to order this type of test. There's a lot of different companies that do it. Um, one company is called Foundation Medicine. Uh, and you can ask your oncologist to order a Foundation Medicine test, but it doesn't have to be Foundation. There's lots of other companies. So for example, here at the Farber, we have an institutionally uh, funded test called OncoProfile that does it for us. So really, the name of the test doesn't matter. It just matters that they're doing a next generation sequencing test on your tumor. Great. Next question. With the COVID pandemic, how will this affect clinical trials now and in the future? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So when COVID first started in March, many of our trials shut down. I would say about 60% of them. I'm happy to say that now COVID is better controlled, all of our trials reopened. Um, but if COVID becomes bad and if there's another surge, um, it might start shutting down some trials. I'm happy to say that not all of our trials were shut down. Even in the worst days of COVID, we still were enrolling some patients on some studies. But yeah, it's possible if it gets bad again that we might have to shut down some of the trials. We're hoping not. I, I would say we've learned a lot about how to continue to care for cancer patients during COVID. And we think cl offering clinical trials is very important. And so we're, we're trying everything possible to keep these trials open. Great. Next question. What if I don't tolerate the trial treatment? Can I opt out? Absolutely. And thank you for this question. A, a clinical trial is always voluntary. I, I think that's probably one of the most important principles of a clinical trial. So it's voluntary to enter into a clinical trial. But still, even after you agree to enter into it, you can leave at any time. And so I can tell you that every oncologist is going to support. If you're having a tough time and this trial is no longer in your best interest because it's causing toxicity, we'll support you just coming off the trial for toxicity. It happens. And we'll just work on finding something else. So yes, I really want to drive this home. The clinical trials are voluntary, not only to enter into it, but each day you stay on, if you decide you don't want to do it anymore, no questions asked, we take you off. Perfect. Next question, at what point in my treatment should I consider looking into clinical trials? You know, um, it's a good question. I, I think if, if you have metastatic gastric or esophageal cancer, I think it's something to just have an ongoing conversation with your oncologist. Just, it just could be a, a question at the end of the visit every month or so, just saying, you know, what do you think about clinical trials for the future? Oftentimes your oncologist might say, you know what, you're on Fox now, it's going great. I don't want to change a thing. And I agree with that. If you're on a treatment that's working, you shouldn't come off it for a clinical trial. You should stick with a winner and stick with that treatment that's working. But really the way you could phrase the question is, look, I'm really happy with the way Fulfox is going. I don't want to come off it. I want to stick with it. It's working. But I also recognize it might not work forever. So I just want to start thinking about a contingency plan for when the Fulfox stops working that we could have, we could at least start thinking about trials when that happens. And that's the way to sort of frame the conversation that I'm very happy with the way I'm getting treated. This therapy is helping me, but I just want to start developing a contingency plan so that when things change and the treatment stops working, we've already started thinking about trials. Great. 
Another question, should I get a second opinion if my doctor doesn't think clinical trials is the right fit for me? Um, it's a good question. I, well, for, the first thing I'll try to say, I think that there, there, it's, it's always good to get a second opinion just to hear what a different doctor thinks about it. But in terms of if they don't, if, if the, your doctor doesn't think a clinical trial is the right fit for you, you know, I can think of many situations where I probably would agree with that, that maybe you're on a treatment that's working now and, and, and why, why change it? Because it, it's, it's working. I, I would agree a clinical trial is not a good fit in that standpoint. Another place where I agree a clinical trial is not a good fit is it's just going to be too logistically demanding. If you just live so far away from a center that has a trial that's really just going to dominate your life doing this trial. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So, you know, I, I think it would depend on the context. Um, and so I could see telling a patient, I just don't think a clinical trial is the right fit for you. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily the reason to get a second opinion. But then going back to first principles, clinical trial or not, I always think second opinions are good. And I can tell you as oncologists, we're not offended when patients go to get a second opinion. It's just going to hear a different person's perspective. I think it's fine. Cancer is very serious. People understand. Great. Uh, another question just came through. How do you know Keytruda works and how long can you be on it? Ah, so this is a good question. Um, so ordinarily, I keep talking about Fulfox because that's, that's the most common treatment. But ordinarily when someone's on Fulfox, you get a CT, you start Fulfox, you stay on it for about eight to 12 weeks and you get a CT scan and, and you, that CT scan helps gauge the effectiveness of therapy. And you're looking to see, did the cancer stay the same size? Did the cancer get smaller? Because if it did, if the cancer is the same size or smaller, that's telling me that the Fulfox is helping you and I wanna keep going. Whereas if that CT scan after eight to 12 weeks of Fulfox is showing the cancer still getting bigger, that's disappointing. And that's showing us that the Fulfox isn't working and we shouldn't be subjecting you to that toxicity. We should take you off. Immunotherapy, by and large, is the same way that if you get a scan eight weeks after and the cancer is still growing, that we should conclude that the immunotherapy probably isn't working. And this is where it gets a little complicated. There is this thing called pseudo progression. And what I mean by pseudo progression is when you're dealing with the immune system, it can cause inflammation. And if you think about spraining your wrist, when you sprain your wrist, it can get really, really swollen. So, in some rare circumstances, a cancer can appear bigger, but it's just swollen. It's just immune cells. And so what we've learned is that in some cases, a CT scan at eight weeks on Keytruda might appear bigger, but then when you look at 12 weeks, it starts to get smaller. So the way I handle this is I try, first of all, I'll do my scans at 12 weeks with drugs like Keytruda. If I can't, if the scan happened at eight weeks, if the patient's feeling well at eight weeks and the cancer got bigger, I might say, you know what? Why don't we just grit our teeth and try to get to 12 weeks, even though we know it probably isn't working, but there's a small chance that maybe it is. Whereas if at eight weeks, the scan on Keytruda shows the cancer is getting bigger and the patient's getting worse, having more pain, having more fatigue, having more nausea, that's telling me I don't think the Keytruda is working and I don't think it's worth staying on it anymore because they're not only having um, radiological progression, the cancer is getting bigger on the scans, but they're also having symptomatic progression. And in those cases, I just take them off the Keytruda and, and go for something else. Great, thank you. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time for more questions today. Dr. Cleary, thank you again so much for joining and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you, I really enjoyed it. Thank you again to our sponsors. Title sponsor, Daiichi Sankyo. Platinum sponsor, Bristol Myers Squibb. Gold sponsors, Astellas and Merck. Silver sponsor, Lily Oncology, and bronze sponsor, Genentech. To view any of our recorded webinars, please visit our lecture library. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you so much for tuning in.